My name is Terry Miller, and I have Dr. Dan Perna here with me as well, and uh, we're very happy to be here. So we'll let Dan go ahead, and we'll get started. Uh, we're just here to present a, a process that Franklin County went through over the past year and a half in connection to the concept of learning gap. Terry uh, needed to do something with that issue as one of his goals. I'll let him explain it. But we put together a program using task tracking in order to determine was there a learning gap? What would we learn about the learning gap? What would teachers share with us concerning the learning gap? So Terry, do you want to explain how this started? Yeah, uh, one of my administrative goals uh, for 1920 was to work at um, figuring out what we needed to do as far as uh, what are especially our level ones and level twos coming in, uh, what type of learning loss or, or lack of learning was going to take place. Um, I talked with Dr. Perna about that and we kind of looked at different ways that we could first address those, those issues that were coming up. We knew that students would not be in class. Uh, we would have to be doing some virtual learning. And we really wanted to see how that was going to affect our students uh, and, and our teachers. And then on the end of that, we also wanted to figure out how to kind of mitigate some of that and, and eliminate those, those learning losses or learning gaps, should we discover any. So the first thing we, we wanted to talk about was this concept of learning loss. Um, and when I, when I talked with Dan, uh, we came to really started looking at that term and really didn't see where we would be losing anything. If you didn't get it in the first place, you really couldn't lose it. So we, we kind of determined that there was probably going to be some learning gaps. And that, that was the approach that we took with this is looking at at that gap between where they are uh, and where they should be. As Terry pointed out, we started with this idea of learning gap because that was in the literature. And so we began to work with it. By the end of this session, we're going to show you that we actually changed that term. But we started with teachers with the concept of learning gaps. And the question Terry and I had to answer was how could we track consistently across all programs to determine if a learning gap did exist. And, and that, that was kind of the process that we started with. So we looked at some of the things that we already had in house, such as task tracking, and try to figure out how we could use that, uh, things that we were already doing, things that teachers were already, the tools they were already using, uh, and incorporate them into the study that we were doing. Now, we also were actually setting up this study to take a look at where students should be when they return to school in the fall of 2020-21. That's a year ago. We were asking teachers where they should be, and we will show you what we had the teachers do with that question before the students arrived in 2020, and, uh, or the fall of 2020. And, and really Really, the issue came down to how can you measure a learning gap? What is it? What tools do we have that we can look at to, to kind of figure out where they are, where they should be? Our last question that we thought that we should take a look at is what methods could we use to close the gap if one existed? Interestingly, the things that we did discover and that we will not go into in great detail, what we discovered was teachers were doing things that they typically did to try to close that gap, whether it be virtual or whether it be in person, they were doing it. One of the things that will come out of this session is the fact that clearly at Franklin County, where they went to a hybrid model of students being here, half of the students being here per day, teachers found that being able to work with half of a class at one time made a significant difference as they were instructing students. So we were asking the question about a method and we found out in the process they did what they typically did, but the biggest thing was that they had half the students at one time. 
And, and that's that's kind of what we we uh, as we've talked about is you can't lose what you didn't have. And that's where the term learning gap uh, that Dan kind of came up with is that uh, we we looked at all of this from from that angle. Dan didn't come up with it. He saw it in the literature. But what we but just use that term so teachers understood the same term in all cases. The other thing was answering that question, how could we track consistently across all programs? And so we used a task tracking tool that Franklin County had in place they were asking teachers to use that tool and we used it on a regular basis as we worked with teachers throughout the year. The first thing that we actually had them do was to identify where they expected students to be at the start of the 2020-21 school year. And an example of this, Terry will explain, we had every teacher take their task and Terry, yeah, we, we looked at all the tasks that the teachers already had, and we kind of did a, uh, I guess, a model first, uh, where we just took a, a blank sheet and we had the teachers go through with their level ones and level twos and just mark off where traditionally they had seen where students were as far as completion rates, what they had done, what they still needed to do. And that gave us a, a kind of a base to work off of. Um, wasn't wasn't real scientific to do it it was more of teacher experience they kind of knew where those students should be but it gave us at least a base for where, where we could start measuring uh students task levels and the number of tasks that they've completed there was another thing that came about with this and that was that we had teachers beginning to think about this where do i typically expect my students to be when they arrive at me so all the teachers filled out a task form. We're just showing a, a small model of one that comes from dental. And what the teachers did in one column of that task form, they marked where they expected level two and level students to, or level three students to be when they arrived at the school in the fall of 2020. Now, our next question was, how could we track consistently across all programs? And what Terry and I decided was that we needed to create a consistent rubric. Terry, Terry do you want to talk about that? Yeah, what we found with, with our teachers were that a lot of times your, your feelings and emotions get mixed in with your grading. Uh, and, and you have kids that you really like and you, you want to give them advanced. Um, we were talking with, with a number of different teachers, uh, and, and of course, the, the reverse of that could happen too. You know, you have a kid that you really don't care for, you're like, well, maybe you mark him a little bit lower. Um, what we did was had some professional development, and, and we'll show you here in a, in a minute on the different, on the rubric that we came up with, and we really got teachers understanding what it meant to assess each student based on exactly what they did, uh, taking the emotions, the feelings out of it, look at what they did, uh, think about what it looked like from an industry standpoint. And uh, one of the teachers that we really talked with was uh, Kevin Grove, who uses this uh, consistently. We'll talk about him a little bit later, but he really helped teachers understand what it meant for a kid to truly be advanced uh, in, their, in their competencies. And what we found was that most students are not advanced. They're competent, but they're not, or proficient, but most students are not advanced. And it was really hard for a lot of teachers to kind of dial that back. Uh, it, 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 was, it was more of, again, the feelings and emotions going into it. Our, Kevin really helped them understand that what advanced means and how that affects not only the student but what that looks like from an employer standpoint when you put that information out that says this kid is advanced and the employers are saying oh, are they really advanced um i think that was one of the biggest things that our teachers learned was how important that that rubric was in assessing students 
we also adopted this rubric because teachers had different approaches of rating students in task tracking. Uh, Terry made the, the, the very important point about the question about what is advanced, but what teachers, some teachers use grading and scores as a way to rate students. Some teachers just rated them when they thought about it. Some teachers were waiting until the senior year to rate students on the task list and using task tracking. We wanted them to begin to think about this across the board as a growth mindset model, showing students where they are at a particular point in time. And then we could take the data and begin to answer this question, was there a gap in the learning that existed? Now we're going to show you each level of the rubric that we built. Every teacher was expected to use this rubric when rating their students. So Terry, if you just open up the first one, I want to point out something right away. As you would begin to look at that advanced level, some people look at this and have said to me, oh, this is easy. You just break it down to one or two words. No, our belief was a student had to do each one of these things to be advanced. For example, to be advanced, the student would have to volunteer to do this task as it had been taught, that the teacher knew that that's when they volunteered, they could do it as it was taught, but that being volunteering was important. The second thing was, if the teacher assigned it, the student willingly accepted the assignment with the task because the teacher had the sense this student can do this as it was taught. Then the other thing was that the teacher knew the student could articulate the terminology. I don't want to go through each one of these, but what I would say to you who are looking at this and being able to read what's there, we wanted teachers not to digest this and make it just a brief statement of advance, this kid can do everything and I trust them. We wanted them to think about each one of these bullet points before saying a student was advanced. With proficient, we did the same thing. Some of you may call that competent. But what we did was, again, the question or the student volunteers. Student willingly accepts an assignment. Student can articulate terminology. Here is a significant difference. When the student offers to do the task or it is assigned to do the task, the teacher realizes the student can take on this assignment if the teacher provides reminders and direct prior to and during the implementation of the task. In other words, while the student's doing it, I trust the student to do it, but I know I'm going to have to give the student reminders. I know I'm going to have to watch the student at least occasionally go and watch what they're doing. And then uh, the question is, will the student do it as it was taught? We wanted that to be put in there. The difference between advanced and proficient very simply is this. With proficient, the teacher has to give some uh, methods or some comments about what's going on or ask some questions while it's taking place. Whereas in advanced, the teacher feels that that student is ready to go without his or her presence in the process of the student doing the task. When it came to basic, we had these bullet points, which you can see as they are shown on the screen. These bullet points were there, and what the teacher basically was looking at is the student may volunteer, but the student can't tell me all the terminology, cannot articulate it as it was taught. The student has limited cognitive knowledge. In other words, if I were to say to the student, all right, what's the process you go through to do this? And the student could not recite that process. Then we felt that's only basic. The student might be able to do it, but doesn't have it nailed. The next point was the teacher recognizes that the student is moving toward accomplishment of the task but the teacher has little to no confidence the student can complete the task without direct 
or sustained teacher supervision. That is a critical point. That student in the system we were using is still basic. The student is not in lack of a better term and using just slang, the student does not have it nailed. Uh, that student does need my help yet in doing this task. And basically speaking, the teacher's observation is that the student is not ready to do the task. We had all of these points in again to help teachers understand the difference because what we're going to show you is we created a point system for advanced, proficient, competent, basic and below basic. Our last thing in the rubric was below basic. And why do we have the task has not been taught? Well, if the teacher defined that I expect my students to come in ready with this, that was critical. If it had not been taught yet, the student absolutely can't do it. But we used all four categories. So even if it had been not been taught, we actually gave the student a point for that if the teacher said it is a place where they should arrive to our classes. And then the other bullet points are there. You know, sometimes we teach a particular task. We have students maybe practice it, but we don't assess it. That was an absolute for below basic. If it had never been assessed, it's still below basic. The teacher has not given it a condition of basic, proficient slash competent or advanced. And so uh, the other point we have there is the one, the task has been taught but not assessed or it's been taught and the student has failed the assessment. It's still below basic. We wanted teachers to actually rate students in that way because of the point system. And we will explain that later, the point system that we were using with this task tracking method. All, all students or all teachers were then assigned to rate all students during semester two in a tra task tracker. Now, let me explain why we have semester two. At Franklin County, students come for one semester at a time. So what we started was get this information to us of where students should be. And then during semester two, we told teachers to rate students. And we had them rating them on a regular and sustained basis until we collected information in semester two from them. And we collected that late in the fourth quarter of the year from the students. Then of course, we reviewed all the data. We determined number of tasks completed by seniors, compared that task, uh, the task compared to tasks of graduates of 2019 and 2020. In other words, last year's students, we compared tasks that they had completed. We did a scoring of each student in the school. We scored each student on the task tracker where they were. And we will show you examples of that. And then we created a percentile chance of the student achieving proficiency before they would graduate. And we actually looked not only at seniors last year, we looked at juniors as well in that process. I think a couple of things that what we what we really learned at, uh, at the end, and I don't think any of these are going to be revolutionary to, to all of you. It's, uh, I've heard this all across the state, but a couple of things that, that we, we found out was that um, even though that a lot of students, most students didn't complete the, the, the number of tasks that they normally complete, um, what we saw was really an increase in the other skills that, that students uh, really need to focus on. And those are your essential or soft skills. Uh, students had to learn to be more resilient. They had to do, learn problem solving. Uh, they had to figure out what to do when you didn't know what to do. Um, I, I think from that standpoint, from an employment standpoint, from a, uh, from a student becoming an adult, uh, uh, it was probably one of the best years I think that we've ever had or 
I would say any school ever had, if you look at it from the positive side, students really had to understand that for, for, for many things, they had to fix it. They were on their own. Uh, yes, that was stressful for, for students, parents, teachers as well, but our theme for the last year was Eye of the Storm, and that's what we wanted to get across to students was don't panic, stay calm, stay in the middle of this. We will help you get through it. Yes, there's going to be a lot more reliance on yourself, um, self-reliance, uh, but that's a good thing. None of this is going to be something that your life is going to be forever ruined. Uh, staying calm and just keep moving forward, doing the best you can. And you really start to learn what the things that were important and the things that weren't important. And, and I think we really came together as a school and as a community uh, to, to help students be successful. What Terry just articulated are the things that we learned in meetings with teachers throughout the whole second semester last year. We were routinely looking at their task list and ratings that they made of students, and we were asking them questions. And what Terry just talked about is one of the things we learned that had nothing to do with the data that we were collecting. It had to do with what teachers were telling us. However, we did create or collect data. Terry. So what we found was that the, the, the number of tasks, obviously, the, the kids weren't here. So what they were completing uh, was, was certainly going to be less. There were, there were less competencies that were done. The interesting part was what they were doing, what, what they were able to accomplish, the quality still remained the same. Um, do the next slide mm -hmm. here. This is kind of uh, uh, an aggregate of all the data that we did collect. And I guess when you look at the, the overall picture of this chart, at least what I do is um, three is, is, is that competent level or that proficient level. That's where really where we wanted our students to at least to be at. So if you look at all the programs, uh, most all of the programs are right in that three competent proficient level. Um, and this is looking at every kid in every program and giving the, giving the average scores. Obviously, there's some kids that are higher and lower, but average-wise, these are the scores uh, that they came up with. And you can see most all of them are right around that three level. There, there's a couple, uh, if you look at HVAC, they're down around 2.2, they're a little lower. And again, a lot of that is, is uh, teacher input, the way he grades, um, and, and the way that, that, that they were we're doing what they do in that in that program. But overall, we really found that the quality, not the quantity, but the quality of what students were doing remained in that proficient, competent level. Uh, I would suggest don't be thrown by what our header is there, level three, level two, level yeah. one. Actually, it's the class of 2019, class of 2020, and class of 2021. Now, you will see some distinct changes. If you look at automotive technology, the average student was at a 2.73 score on the task tracking system. That's lower than what he had been. But what Mr. Anderson explained to us was auto technology has so many tasks, he was having difficulty getting them to that level. Cosmetology is below three, but if you know, it's very consistent across all three years. And what the cosmetology teachers were telling us is that's typical. Proficiency in cosmetology to them means they're ready for the state test. That's their thing. So their ratings are every year a little bit lower than some of the other programs. If you look at electronics, it's the same concept. Electronics, it was below the 3.0 level, but yet consistent with other years. And so if we look at diesel mechanics, I think that's one. Mm -hmm. You will notice on diesel mechanics, the 2019, 2020, the average of all of his students was a 3.0. That means they were proficient as a group right on the nose. But last year, 2021, they were not. They were a 2.75. Now, you might say, well, there is a learning gap. 
we would submit, and we'll get to this later, it's not a learning gap. It's a, the term we're going to use, a learning delay. Kevin Grove, who we will highlight here in a moment with what he does, is very clear in the way he has students work toward the task list and accomplishing those tasks. And his point was, without their being in school every day, it was more difficult to get them to attain the task level that they had in the past with the whole class. Now, we also did something very unique and I'm not a statistician, but we worked on this. <laughs> we used a rating system as a predictor of success so that we could meet with teachers with their ratings of students and say, is this rating indicating what we think it is and the, the system that we use? So Terry, if you go to the next slide, we'll explain what it is. This is a welding class, part of a welding class, is what I should say. We took a look at both level three and level two students. What you see on the far left as you are looking at this chart, it says that the total number of points that a student would have to achieve for full proficiency is 243 points. What that means is, if you take all tasks and advanced is four, proficient is three, basic is two, and below basic is one, and you average all tasks and you count up all tasks as being proficient, a student should have at least 243 points at the end of their career. That's three times 81 tasks. Now, what we did, we took a look at each student and we determined where the student was in the number of tasks that they had completed at the time we looked at them. For example, in the very first one, the student had completed 90.1% of the 81 tasks and had been rated on each one of those above below basic. They had been rated as basic, proficient slash competent or advanced. So what that student number, the first student had was a 3.60 average, if I'm correct. That means I'm at a distance from this. <laughs> you can see it better than we can. But anyway, what that indicated was that student had a lot of fours, had many fours and was rated that way. We use this information by accumulating the student's total point total. That included the four points for being advanced. And then we divided that by the 243 needed. And at that point in the year, midway through the quarter, what we determined was this first student, or I'm sorry, second student, as we're looking at, this second student in blue, had a 89.7% chance of being proficient at the end of the year. We were just giving this figure because now if you look over on the far right column, we use this data to indicate with an X, here's a student that is having a problem right now. Now, you might say, well, I would know that just by task tracking on my own. You are correct. You may, if you task track on a regular and sustained basis. Remember, we were having the teachers do this. They were tracking along the way throughout this whole group of second semester, throughout the whole second semester with this whole group of students that they had. We even did level ones, which we're not showing you right now. But we met with each teacher and said, where we found an X, is that student in dire trouble of being competent by the time they leave this spring? We found that definitely it was true. And teachers were saying to us, this, this data, they don't all love data, but this percentile rating that you're putting in there, of being able to reach proficiency really tells us something about where each one of our students is. Now, remember, just to review, the students or the teachers were all using the exact same rubric 
and the teachers were regularly rating students on the task tracker. They were not just rating, they've got it done, they don't have it done. They were rating them, and I want to make a point about the rating. Here's what would happen. In October, for example, a student may have come back from last year or the previous year, and the student may have accomplished a task the year before, but actually wasn't doing very well with it, where the teachers are now rating that student basic. They were rating it another time, and so we would come up with these figures. We did this with every student in the school at the end of the year last year. There was about a, not quite a month to go when we did this, so that the teachers could look at every student they had at that time and what were the chances, the percentile chances of that student ultimately being proficient by the time they graduated. Terry and I were very concerned what students are in trouble. Where you see an X, that student was going to have difficulty. If you go to the bottom three, the bottom three are level two students. They were juniors last year, but they were lagging behind in accomplishing their task on the task tracking. And so therefore, each one of them has an X because they were below where they needed to be. They needed to be at a least a 60% uh, chance of being proficient by the time they would graduate and they were not there. So they were uh, students who were in danger. I think one of the interesting things about <clears throat> this chart was that as we brought the teachers in and you see where all the X's are, um, Dan would start asking, hey, is this kid having trouble? Is this kid having trouble? And the teachers just kind of smile like, yeah, how do you know that? So it was the teachers knew it, um, but this data really pointed it out that uh, it kind of confirmed what the data says as, as what the what the teachers knew. So another thing that we looked at, obviously last year, we didn't do the performance on, uh, on the NOFTI. We did do the written exams. Uh, we just wanted to kind of get some data from that. And I didn't do a, a long historical review of the of the of the dog. I just went back one year and looked at the written scores. But this is this is what we found is that in 2019, 2020, uh, we tested 109 students uh, on the written NOCTI. Uh, we found uh, that 72 of those students were advanced, 32 were competent, and, and five were basic. Uh, last year, we we tested 244, um, and you can see what the advanced, competent, basic scores were. The percentages, I think, are, are what is interesting. Um, we lost, our, our students went down as far as, as advanced levels. What we saw was, was an increase in competent and a bigger increase in that basic level. So again, it did show some things that, that uh, students weren't quite where they needed to be from a NOCTI standpoint. This chart, by the way, is important to what we've already told you. We're going to ultimately say that there is learning delay. We don't, we don't see learning gap, learning loss. What we see is learning delay, and it's not dramatic, uh, surprisingly. And their teachers here give some reasons why they believe it's not dramatic. But there is a learning delay that is occurring. So this is uh, what Kevin Grove uh, comes up with, came up with as far as diesel. Now he's been using this system for quite a while, and it tied really well into the analysis that that I wanted to do. Um, and I adopted a lot of his stuff over. Uh, it's it's really interesting how he can take the system that we we just showed you and implemented it on a personal level into his program and really do some implementation with it. I want to make a point about Kevin Grove, and that is that Kevin Grove has used task tracking as a growth mindset model with his students now for, I'm going to say, seven or eight years. Yeah. He has just really gotten into the concept of task tracking from the moment a student arrives until a student graduates. 
And he has a system, which Terry's going to show you how he does this. But those of you that may be familiar with growth mindset, Kevin Grove has a, a perfect example with each student of growth mindset because he is working with students every day on their task list. Every day they are moving forward on the task list. And the interesting thing is when it comes to rating his students, it is individualized. He has in, uh, told me in a meeting I had with him last week, he has three sophomores currently who he believes that no later than the start of their junior year, and he's talking about the first month of their junior year, they will be rated competent in every task in diesel technology. He, his point is they are driven, they work at this, they do everything. So what Kevin offers is a growth mindset model on an individual basis with every student. This is what Kevin uses. He gives this to his students. He gives it to parents. Uh, he, he uses this as far as working with guidance counselors, um, with uh, IEP students that really starts to put together of what a student needs to do uh, as an individual in order to just be on the basic level for his, for his program. So if you look down along the left-hand side, it says base. That's basic level. So, in order for a student to get 100% to be at, at at the highest level of basic competencies in the first week, that student will have to have completed 4.2 tasks. By the second week, 8.4, and you see all the way through for that semester. In order for that student to be to be 100%, and this is just this is not the advanced level or even the proficient level, this is the basic level. They would have to complete 75.6 tasks uh, in that in that nine in that 18 week period. And you can see and that again he uses that as his grading system. So as you get down through there, you can see as the, the less tasks they complete, obviously their grades go down. So again, don't look at this as advanced or proficient. This is the base. This is where they need to start from. And, and obviously as they get down further, uh, it, it gets a little, little more complicated for them. This is something that once, and I would say in two weeks into Kevin's program, kids know, parents know, guidance counselors know, uh, special education uh, teachers know where that kid is, where they where they should be, and more importantly, if if they are behind, the likelihood of them getting to that. 18 week period is it starts to diminish the further down that list they go. It's it is a it is a wonderful way for for everyone to see exactly where they're at uh, every two weeks. And it's a great predictor of, of where they will be uh, by the end of that semester. Kevin has this to a point that what he works with uh and in defining if students can do the competency directly relates to the rubric that we presented he was one of the people that helped us to build that rubric that is exactly what he's looking for the basic concept of the rubric. but i want to share this with you because i think it's critical kevin starts this day one it's not just week one day one he actually has act activities with all of his students that they begin. Now, we're not going to show you another thing that he does because he has students coming different times to the school. He actually has this broken down by sending school and the amount of time that students will be here. And he shares with them how many hours that, or how many tasks they're going to have to complete in the hours that they are here which means if they have less time, they've got to really start moving if they want to get to the 100% level in proficiency by the time that they are at the end of their junior year. Kevin's goal is that all of his seniors will go out on co-op. Not all of them do, but that's his goal. That, that's something that you don't see on this chart. This is for JB or James Buchanan, one of the sending schools, and Waynesboro, they come at the same times. 
there are we have six sending schools and each come at a different time so he has a a different chart like this for every sending school so it, it truly is individualized for the for the sending school and right down to the student and the number of hours that they spend in his program okay. so our conclusions were this if you looked at any of our data we could not in any way conclusively say there was a wholesale learning gap across the school because as Terry showed you Nocti was close yes there was some difference but it was close if we looked at task tracking and compared number of tasks completed we found that compared to other graduating years students were completing close to the same number of tasks, except in those couple of programs that we showed you on the charts that we showed you. So we concluded we could not say there is a learning gap, even though we only had students here half the time last year. Now I will throw out this thought, Terry shared with you the idea of how we learned that teachers were learning things that were very good that had nothing to do with our data. Here's one of the things the teachers in this school are still saying. The teachers in this school are still saying to me, I just met with them again on an individual basis. I met with every teacher in the school two times so far this year. And here's one thing I'm hearing over and over. Last year, I was able to accomplish so much when I only had half of the students at one time in my class. Now, there are different theories about that, but what the teachers were saying, when they only had half the students here at one time, they really worked on performance tasks, and they could give more one-on-one -on -one time with their students. Um, and, and, I, and I think there were there was a, some other things that, that we looked at as well. Um, again, I, and I alluded to this earlier on, you know, kids really started to understand that they were held accountable for a lot of things. We we heard we heard over and over again school being closed, and we had our teachers constantly tell school is not closed. School is still in session. This is a different way of learning, and and it took a while for students to really understand a a different way of learning. Not every kid did well. Just like every kid doesn't do well. Virtually, every kid doesn't do well when they're here in person either. So it, I think the biggest thing that we found out is that these flexible schedules can be uh, very beneficial depending on the type of student. Some students do well virtually. They should probably get that opportunity to continue with that. Some students do need to be in person. Uh, maybe those students need to be in school full time or even more. But there was a lot of things that just from that one year that really made people realize that you could do some things that education had never done before in fact even said that was impossible and last year was required uh, it really made a big difference as far as our our team in fact uh, i've heard teach, some teachers say that they they would like to go back to that last year um they're having some some difficulty this year with all the kids being back so there's some again it's, it's like starting school all over again as you saw in all the data, what we found was students performed at different rates. But when we met with the teachers individually, if you remember that column that had the X's of students in trouble, many of the teachers said, you know, in a normal year, I have that many students who are having difficulty getting to this proficient level of, of all of their competencies. Now, one of the things Terry and I have not shown you, but we did take a look at, on the task tracking system was we saw no change in theory ratings where it was pure theory we actually saw i remember one program in particular hvac where students were scoring higher last year than they had in the past that may be just logical and make common sense because there was a heavy emphasis on the theory but we saw no change in theory rating as opposed to a gap, we found the lack of time for performance assessment showed a learning stoppage. 
Auto tech was a prime example. Kevin Groves program in diesel technology, another prime example. In our assessment with data, we found those programs had less tasks being completed or less tasks being rated at the proficient and, and competent level because the performance assessment was not present because the students were not in school. Our final conclusion was very simple. The real learning gap actually may be a learning delay because students have not achieved as much as they did in previous years. We did see that, that they have not achieved as much. When we compared, for example, the high rating of advanced, it was not nearly as high last year as it had been in other years on the task tracking system. Now, Terry and I both saw a positive in that because we have heard from employers over and over, you gave me this kid and on this task tracking thing of his, it says he's advanced and he's not advanced. We felt the rubric really began to define for teachers what advanced meant. And we thought that was very important. I think that's everything. Well, there's a couple questions up here, Dan. Um, okay. For the predictor, do you mean for the 21-22 school year this year, when did this project begin? Um, I, I think both. Yeah, I, I would say both. Uh, it was it certainly was a predictor almost immediately. You could see where kids were at the at the time. And as you continue to use these tools, uh, you can you can continually over and over again assess those kids almost on a weekly basis as to where they're at uh, and and kind of predict as as to what their success is going to be. Terry is correct. It was both. If you remember, we showed you level three and level two students. We even had, we didn't show you this, but we had level one students that we looked at. It was a predictor for all three years because we took the number of tasks that had been taught to that student and then ask where are they on the task tracking system. And so we were able to come up with that calculated predictor for each group of students, whether they were level one, level two, or level three. This year, we have been working with teachers to ask them, is that predictor staying in place? And they're saying, yes, it is. However, because they're so conscious of it, they are finding some students that were predicted not being able to succeed are now moving a little bit further because they're using this as a growth mindset model. Uh, the other one is a uh, copy. Of, yeah, we'll make sure they get a copy of the rubric. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I really commend Dan on putting that together. That was an awesome way. And, and through that discussion, it really helped me and I think it helped a lot of teachers understand what how to assess students fairly and accurately don't give me credit terry i read a lot <laughs> of literature on this and what i found about rubrics there are all kinds of rubrics out there but what the rubric has to do is specify all of the expectations for the teacher of, of we all expect this of all our students and so that made it universal that's everything that, uh, that I didn't see any more questions. Um, I think that that covers all, all of our stuff. So thank you very much. Don't be afraid to contact Terry or me. Uh, there are our phone numbers and our email addresses. Feel free to give us a con uh, uh, a question on uh, in email if you want or contact us. And uh, if you want the rubric, please send me an email. <laughs> and I will I will then forward the copy of the rubric to you. Thanks a lot, and we appreciate your time.